class is mostly on the board and on the, on the slide, um, whiteboard and whiteboard. There's no real extra slides, so there weren't any posted to the website. Um, in general, there were some, there were some questions here to have the slide posted Sunday or the whole week. Um, not possible. I worked on the slide until right like before the class. It's the first time I'm teaching it. I'm taking the old slides and substantially updating them and revamping them. I do not have a Thursday's class ready by Sunday. Thursday's class gets ready on Wednesday. Um, and that's just the reality when I'm teaching two classes. I'm taking a 700 level course at the university. I've got meetings back to back day and day out. I'm just not able to get all the slides for the week ahead ready for the Sunday. But I will try to at least give you 8 to 10 hours of um, uh, notice so that I'm talking to you will have a good amount of time to print it out. So, this evening's class, like I said, there's no, no extra slides, it's really good on the board. And I take it from the point where we went last time on the CSTR. So, we looked at the battery reactor and then we moved to the CSTR. And we're going to apply the general mole balance to the CSTR. And this is uh, needed to answer the questions in the tutorials for the next. Uh, the notation we're introducing here is that we've got inlet CJ0. So the concentration of the species J that we're modeling at the inlet. J, uh, XJ0 is the molar flow. So that's moles per second of J. So XJ0 is moles per unit time coming into the system. And that issue here is that it's moles of J. It's moles are always for a species. Moles are not for a general stream. The general stream that contains mixed components, we can't define the number of moles. Okay. So it's not, it's, not, it's not correct for me to say what are the number of moles of air in this room. I can't answer the question. I can answer what are the number of moles of oxygen, what are the number of moles of nitrogen, but I can't answer what the moles of air. So the mixed stream doesn't have the concept of moles. Moles are only applied to species J. And then there's this notation small v0 referring to the volumetric flow. So v0 is the volumetric flow. Now I'm going to make a change here. This is the worst possible notation I've ever seen chosen for v being for the volumetric flow and capital V being the volume. There's very little difference between that V and that V. And it's going to confuse you, it's going to confuse me. The only way you can ever tell them apart is when it's actually printed and you get that cursive notation there. So I'm changing volumetric flow from now on to Q, which is actually the standard notation for it. I have no idea why Fogler is using the lower case here. So Q is the volumetric flow, which is minus Q per time, or volume per unit time. Volume per unit time. That material is flowing into this, this tank. It's being agitated. It's well mixed. There's a volume, capital V, of material in the tank. The volume here, capital V, does not refer to the volume of the tank. It refers to the volume of the material. And this is the conceptual part that you must understand of the CSTR. That is, takes a, it, it, it's obviously wrong, but it's how we can see the CSTR to operate. This material flows in CA0. Let's use A as my substrate. So CA0 comes into my tank and being well mixed. Then leaving out here is CA. CA leaving is also the concentration of A in the tank. So what the conceptual problem comes for people who get started with reactor design is well, how can I add material CA? And the moment it goes from, the in, from above the liquid phase to in here, it suddenly turns to CA. How can I go from CA0 to CA? These reactions don't happen instantaneously. We know that some of these reactions occur really slowly. So CA0 coming in suddenly becomes CA in the tank, and that's what's leaving. That is the conceptual way we see CSTR. It's clearly not correct. Okay, but the CSTR, the assumption is that this material coming in, CA0, comes in in the tank, let's say uh, it physically lands up here on the top left-hand side, and it's going to take some time for this molecule of A to 
to move through the system and it gets depleted over time from CA0, so a little, a little box of A at whatever concentration CA0 is slowly reacting away as it moves randomly through the reactor and eventually leaves at CA. Now some material will go straight through from the inlet to the outlet and actually come through out at a higher concentration. Other material will stay in the reactor and move around for a very long time before it actually ends up leaving. The net of that, the average concentration leaving, however, is what we call CA. So clearly some of this is at higher concentration, some of it's at lower concentration, but for a well-mixed system, these blend in and it averages out so that what leaves is CA. Okay, so clearly not everything coming in CA0 suddenly turns into CA. It's still every, every molecule or component of A takes some time to turn into CA from CA0, and so the average leaving is CA. It's a conceptual idea, but obviously the more well mixed the system is, the better that, that assumption is. But it is a key assumption we make when, we, when we're building a mathematical model for a CSTR. Okay, so I, I want to emphasize that point. Um, last class then we started looking at the mole balance. So mole balance is in minus out plus generated is equal to the accumulation in the system. And for CSTR, when I'm referring to that in minus out and the accumulation, The system that we're modeling is the system that's given by the boundary shown by my blue mark. So it's the in coming into that blue region minus what's leaving out of the blue region there at the exit plus whatever's being generated inside this region. And then the net of that, the leftover, is what's, what's accumulating and staying in the tank. And so then up here we have this that in is the flow rate, in flow rate out of, of species J, plus generated then is the integral. Now, if we make this assumption, well, okay, let, let's follow this slide up here for now. We're integrating over the total volume V. And to emphasize that the rate of reaction is a function of the volume, dV, and then the accumulation of J inside the volume. Now we, we, we bring in the steady state assumption. Steady state assumptions is a very strong assumption. It, it, it implies a lot of things for us. Okay? But the key thing about the steady state assumption, the way we should interpret it, is if I look at this reactor now, and then I wait a couple of minutes and I look at it again, I would not be able to tell the systems apart at those two different times. So steady state says absolutely everything about the system between now and later, nothing is changing. And so that implies, obviously, that there's no time dependence. So steady state implies, firstly, in this equation at least, that dn j by dt is zero. That's the first key assumption. Yeah. What is the dn about the integral? That's the volume we're That's the volume we're integrating over. So it's the volume of the boundary, which in this case is yeah. the blue region. It's the volume of the material in the ground. So the steady state assumption firstly implies that dn by dt is, is zero. The other key thing is that all the, all the things about the reactor are constant over time. The CA, the concentration in the tank at some time, is equal to CA at some time plus delta t. So sometime in the future, the concentration in the tank is the same as what it was back a few minutes or seconds ago. The same would apply for temperature, the same would apply for viscosity, the same would apply for density. All the properties of the tank are constant over time and not changing. So the steady state is a very, very, um, very, very powerful assumption we're making. In addition to that, it also implies. Okay, so oh, I see here, I know that some people at the back can't see. Um, so the steady state also implies. the volume is constant over time. The volume is 
is not changing the time. Okay, so for a tank, the implication that the volume is constant with time means that if I've got material flowing in here with flow rate Q0 coming in, the material leaving with flow rate Q, so that was the lowercase b that I that had there before. So Q0 and Q and V, I'm now changing those to Qs, remember. So the volumetric flow is also constant with time. If this flow Q0 was faster than that Q, my tank would be filling up with, with time. If Q0 was smaller than Q, my tank would be draining slowly over time. So the steady state assumption implies that everything about the system is constant. Yes, and yes. Okay, so the volume is always the volume of the liquid in the tank. Well, no, volume of liquid in the tank, not the entry. What about the generating volume? Okay, so in the case when the system is generating volume, which is not true for most liquid systems, then Q0 and Q need to be balanced so that they match the generated volume. Okay? But for most practical systems, the volume is not going to grow larger and larger for liquid phase. For gas phase, yes. Okay, so for gas phase, we cannot always assume constant volume. But for liquid phase, it's a great assumption. Okay. So let's complete this here. Implies dv by dt is equal to zero, especially for liquid systems. state really, really a strong assumption. It implies a lot of things that are, are simplifications for us. The other key simplification we make um, is we're assuming no spatial variation in the reactor. That allows us then to say no spatial variation assumption. Implies the simplification there of the rate expression. So, No spatial variation implies we can write Rj of V is simply just Rj. In other words, the reaction rate is not a function of where we are inside this volume. So whether we're in the top left or the bottom right, the reaction rate is the same value. This is not going to be true for the next reactor that we look at. Okay, so this is why I, I find it key to go, let's go through it reactor by reactor, understand what the key assumptions are, so that when you plug into your mole balance, you can understand what you can cancel and what you cannot cancel. So for, for these systems, for a CSTR system, making the assumption of steady state simplifies the equation for us quite a bit, and the assumption of being well mixed, a second assumption implies that Rj is not a function of volume. That implies then that when we integrate over the volume and Rj of V dV, we can simplify that and write Rj, the integral of dV over the volume, which is simply Rj times capital P. Okay, so this generated term then simplifies quite substantially. So if I then go back to my mole balance and use those simplifications, now I get Fj0 minus Fj plus Rj times V is equal to DNA, DNJ by dt, which is 0. And I can rearrange that to get the equation that's up there on the slides. V is equal to Fj0 minus Fj divided by the rate of depletion of J. So minus Rj in the denominator. Using both assumptions, I'm using the assumption of no spa spatial variation to simplify G of J, and using the steady state assumption to set the Nj by dt equal to zero. So I'm invoking both assumptions to make this, uh, to get to this final point. Okay, so 
Okay, and, and let's do a double check on the units. We should always do that for our equations. We've got units of what in the numerator? Moles per time per moles per time. Okay, so moles per in the volume in the numerator in the denominator. RJ's units, minus RJ's units. This one you must know. Moles per time per volume. Okay. So volume, volume, moles, moles. We get units of time. No, I think um, the numerator is. Oh, yeah. Moles per time. Okay. I understand. So moles per time, and then we're left with units of volume. So that's correct. I do want to um, introduce some, some, a new term that we're going to see in the next few classes coming up. And that is, we're going to often substitute here Fj with the concentration multiplied by the volume of the flow. So we want to make this substitution that Fj, this equation holds in general, is equal to Cj times Q. Okay, so in other words, I'm saying moles per time is equal to moles per unit volume times volume per unit time. We like to use this expression. We like to sub in Cj times Q for Fj. So our mole balance is in terms of Fj. But FJ is really hard to measure. I cannot buy a sensor that measures the molar flow. It's impossible for me to do that, except for a pure stream. But it's very easy for me to buy a sensor that measures the flow rate as a volume over time. So meters cubed per second, I can buy a flow, flow rate, a flow meter. CJ, easy, difficult to measure. Easy to measure for, the mo for most systems. Okay, so two easy measurements gets me one really difficult one, that or impossible. Okay, so Cj times Q, we like those units, I uh, like those those two because they're far more approachable, easier to work with. So let's um, sub those into this expression over here. The volume then is equal to Fj0 is Cj0 coming in, the concentration coming into my reactor, multiplied by Q0 minus Fj is equal to Cj times Q leaving divide through by minus R A. Okay, so just using this notation of what's coming in is CJ0, what's leaving is CJ, Q0 and Q. textbook, but it's great to know. It's not into the textbook in chapter one, it comes later, but we'll introduce this terminology tau 
is equal to V divided by Q. Okay, and you'll pull that residence time. Anyone heard that term before? Residence time? Can you explain it to me? Uh, it's how long something stays inside the thing. That's great. That's very great to explain. So, how long something stays inside the tank? Okay. If we look at that equation, it makes sense. V is the volume of liquid that I've got. Q is how fast I'm putting the liquid in. It's the number of times I'm replacing that liquid. Okay. How long does it take you to replace all the volume capital V in the tank? So you can see it as how, how long is it taking to replace capital V? Okay, so that's another way to say it. How long does it take to replace capital V? The longer the residence time, the longer the material spends in the tank. Short residence times means it stays in there for a very brief period before it leaves at the exit. Okay, so given that new definition then of residence time, how long something spends in the reactor, how long does it take for a molecule of A coming in, and how long does it spend in the reactor? Let me rewrite this whole balance then in terms of residence time. And then you see why I've been looking at this. So I say that V, my volume of my, my, uh, my liquid in the tank, divided by Q is the, uh, the residence time. And that is equal to Cj0 minus Cj divided by the rate of consumption okay. if I, let's, take a, let's take a specific example. The residence time is equal to Ca0 minus Ca divided by minus Ra. Let's consider a system where A goes to some, some products. If I'm aiming for a specific CA leaving the reactor, okay, so here's my reactor. I've got CA0 coming in, I've got CA leaving. Okay, aim for a specific CA. So in other words, my boss says, I want you to get CA leaving there. We need a purity um, of, a, un of unreacted A leaving the tank to be very small. We don't want to give our customers our raw material, we want to give them the final product, presumably B or some other product. We want to react A almost totally, so in other words, let's aim for say 0.01 moles per liter, for example. So the value doesn't matter, the value, what matters here is that it's a fixed quantity. I don't want CA to change. Looking at that equation, CA needs to be fixed. This is my target. And tau is how fast I'm putting material in and replacing it here in the reactor. What's going to happen in the situation where CA0 increases? increases, everything else stays constant, CA0 goes up, I need CA to stay the same. Okay, so let's say for example, I'm buying CA0 from a supplier in India, and then next week they start to ship me product that's actually got a greater concentration than what I've normally used in the past. For whatever reason, they're sending me more concentrated A, I still need the same target. What do I need to do to my system in order to make sure CA stays the same? 
increase the volume. So if CA goes up, and this must all stay the same, I must increase tau. Okay, tau must go up, or well, that implies V over Q. Is that the only thing I can do? What else can I do? I can drop flourish. Okay, so I have always got one or two degrees of freedom to, to play with, to, to keep things constant. So don't just look at equations as equations. Think of what you can do with them. Now let's say for some reason I increase the temperature in the system and that reaction rate in the denominator goes, goes up. What do I need to go to? A larger volume or a smaller volume? Okay. So the reaction rate in the denominator goes higher. To compensate for it, I need to drop my volume down or increase my flow rate through the system. Okay. <coughs> so I want you to, to, to work with these equations and, and see them in that, in that light. Everyone comfortable with CSTRs? Any questions on that before we move on to the next reactor? Okay, a few questions of this already in the tutorial. So some of you who had the tutorial this morning, um, you've already try to work through some of these ideas, those that are, will, the rest of you will see it in tomorrow's tutorial. Now let's take a look at the next reactor, which we call the plug flow reactor, the PFR. Okay, so what I thought to do is just to show you a few pictures of the PFR. Uh, don't worry, this is not, like this is not all in your textbooks. The fact that you don't have this in the slides doesn't matter too much. But here's a PFR, uh, a good example. PFR is simply a tube, a long tube. Okay, so here's a company, PFR, plug flow reactor. It's simply just a tubes that go up and down, up and down over there, and that's probably several hundred meters long. So it's a tubular reactor. Here's another example, but a very specific one, the polyethylene reactor. The tube where the reaction is taking place is only 16 inches <coughs> in diameter on the inside of it. Yet we need that very large reactor because the pressure inside there is 35,000 psi. So that metal shell is there to contain the pressure. We obviously need that pressure and that high temperature to get to the kinetics, that, uh, the reaction rates that we need. So I could choose to probably operate this at lower temperatures, lower pressures, but I'm going to need a much, much bigger reactor. The higher temperatures and pressure, the faster my reactor uh, reaction rate, probably the smaller the reactor. But now I have to go engineer it to be a safe system. So extra thickness there required to the standard pressure. This is another picture that you see in the textbook just to explain. Here's my inlet feed coming through this header pipe. It gets split down into six different sub subsections here. And then each one further gets split into these individual tubes in that bundle. So a tubular reactor can be split and you can run it in parallel. So every one of these tubes is a, a tubular reactor. So we will, we'll get to this in the next section of the class. If I do the calculations and I find my tubular reactor needs to be six kilometers long, what are the options that I have? Well, I can maybe split down my feed into multiple tubes of smaller length each, okay, and then operate them in parallel and then recombine the, the exit <coughs> at the end. Okay, so that's just some illustrations then of, of, a, of a tubular reactor. Now let's take a look at the modeling for it. So there's my tube. I'm going to introduce this coordinate down here is zero. That's the entry to my tube, and it's going to go all the way along to a final volume, capital V. So this is the vol volume V at the exit. And what I'm going to do is, inside this tube, my reactant is coming in at the entrance. And as my, my reactant, let's call it A, comes in, it's going to start reacting as it moves down this tube. 
And at the end, I'm going to get CA leaving. So at the exit, I've got CA that's leaving concentration. And at the entrance, I have CA0 coming in. So as we move through this, plot, this uh, tube, where our concentration is changing as a function of position. Okay, so this is not like the CSTR. The CSTR, everything inside the reactor is well mixed and at the same concentration. Plug flow reactor, very, very different way of operating. The material coming in is at a certain concentration. It moves through the system and leaves at a, at a different concentration. Let's take a small slice. This is standard differential equation idea. We're going to take a small slice of volume delta V. And I'm going to do a mole balance just over that small slice. We call that slice a plug. Yeah, so this is called a plug. That's why we call this a plug flow reactor. The key assumption is that that plug is so small in width that everything inside the plug is at the same conditions. Same concentration, same temperature, everything inside of that is well mixed. So if I looked at that plug, what we say is we'll use this assumption to call well mixed in the radial direction. So at any particular location, the radial direction refers to this distance in, through the radius. Within that radial direction, everything is well mixed in the plot. And then just another term is the axial direction, which is the direction from the entrance to the exit along the axis here. So things change in the axial direction. In the radial direction, everything is assumed to be constant and well mixed. Okay, so if I took that plug, so there's my plug. Okay, here's my, my center line. This direction off the center line is my radial direction. So everything in that radial direction at 0, 1, 2, 3, up to R is the same. Whatever the distance from the center line to the outer radius, no matter where I go, from that center line up to the perimeter, everything is the same. My concentration is the same, temperature is the same in the radial direction. Okay. This is the axial direction. Things change along the axial direction. So I took this plug and I shifted it to the start of the reactor. The concentrations and the temperatures and the conditions at the start of the reactor are different to the middle or different to the end. So things change in the axial direction Things remain the same and are constant in the radial direction. Is the concentration constant within the plug? In the plug. That's the key assumption. It's well mixed in the radial direction, i.e. the plug. Okay. So everything in the plug is got the same condition. Let's take a look at a, at a volume balance in the plug. I'm oh, sorry, did I say volume balance? I should have said molar balance. Molar balance. So coming into the plug, We'll use this notation Fj at V, leaving the plug 
we had a flow rate fj and v plus delta v. Okay. So that subscript refers to the distance along the axial direction. So here we, we are at position v, and here we're at position v plus delta v. Remember, the axial direction is recorded as the to total accumulated volume. So at the entrance to my reactor, V is equal to zero. At the exit of my reactor, V is equal to V, the total volume. I'm then somewhere in between that everywhere else. So I define my, my reference relative to the start and the end of my tube. And it's V is either zero at the entrance or capital V by the end, and somewhere in between everywhere else. So at the entrance to the plug, I've got some fluid V, FJ, subscript V at the exit, FJ, subscript V plus delta V. Then I'm going to do the generated term within the plug. So what's being generated in the plug? Let's do the integral of the delta V as the volume of the plug times the rate of reaction in the plug is equal to the accumulation in the plug, so D and J and T. At steady state, another time we're using steady state, but this time steady state means something different in a tubular reactor. At steady state in a tubular reactor, it, the key assumption is that there is no accumulation of material. If steady state assumption was violated for a tubular reactor, it means things start to build up in your, in your, in your tube at, at a certain point. What's the steady state assumption applies that material moves in and just keeps moving along the, the, the tube. So at steady state, E and J, Vt is equal to zero. We get nothing accumulating in that plug. So species J, whatever J is, if it's the reactant or the, or the product, they're moving along the tube and moving down into the next plug. But they're not staying in that plug and building up. So that's zero. <coughs> then we can write then, we can simplify that equation. Oh, sorry, let me just add another assumption here using the well-mixed assumption. implies this integral simplifies. The integral of the delta V Rj is not, not a function of the volume anymore. <coughs> so Rj dV is then equal to Rj times delta V. Okay. So the well-mixed assumption implies that this simplifies. Yes. It would always be well mixed. Yeah. Right. Within that plug, that's what our assumption is. Okay, okay and We're plugs not are not always well mixed. It's a very this is a crucial assumption is to assume that in the radial direction we're well mixed. Yeah. We know for laminar flow that's not true. Right? We know that from our fluid flow of course. So it means we need to design this tube to ensure that material is well mixed. One way we can do that is we can pack it with packing to call it to encourage turbulence. We can operate at high flow rates through there to get turbulence as well. And so it's a crucial assumption, isn't it? Yes? But this well-mixed assumption implies that the axial direction. No, because we're only we're doing a mole balance in the plug. Yeah. So then the plug is also not There's no change in the axial direction. So within the plug, no change in the axial direction. Over the entire reactor, oh, absolutely, things are changing in the, in the absolute rate. So, if we let's take this mole balance in the plug and, and write it back out again with those simplifications in mind. Right. FJ. 
minus delta V minus Fj at V divided through by delta V is equal to Rj. So using those assumptions of well mixed you know, steady state. Now this looks very similar to what you see in your calculus course. That's f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided through by delta x. And we know that from the calculus that as delta x tends to zero, that tends to df by dx. Okay, so we'll use the same idea. So this is a similar structure. fj at v plus delta v, fj at v divided through by delta v has the same structure. So using the same idea, we can write then that that is equal to dfj by dx as delta v tends to zero. So as that plug's width becomes smaller and smaller, I can then essentially change my mole balance in this, in this discrete form using v's and delta v's into a differential form and just write dfj by dx. One thing I want to emphasize here, even though we've spoken about radial direction and I've drawn a, a circular pipe, I have not anywhere assumed circular geometry in, in doing that integral. I could use square tubing. I could use triangular tubing in any shape. The, the tube can in fact change from beginning to end along my reactor. So there is no assumption of geometry. That's crucial. No geometry assumption, i.e. Not necessarily cylindrical. The only requirement is that we're well mixed and within the plug uh, we're well mixed and that we've got steady state. equation and, and just use it here <coughs> just to quickly illustrate some ideas. Nothing changes. But we, uh, the key is we've not used any assumption of any shape. So this equation applies no matter what the shape of the tube. So dfj Sometimes write DFJ over RJ is equal to DV. These are the, either form of that is my key equation for a tubular reactor. And so I could integrate this then between the limits. I'll integrate between FA0 at the entrance. FA, the flow of A leaving at the exit. I'll just talk about that in a minute. to highlight the following. What we're integrating then is FA, the flow of A coming in. So 
at the, at the start of my reactor, the beginning of that tube, I have a certain FA0. This is the number of moles per second I'm adding into the entrance of the reactor. Flow rate of A in. It's going to change across the reactor all the way from the entrance at V equals zero to V equals capital V at the exit. What's going to be the shape of that curve? Across the volume. So across this x-axis, what is likely going to happen from this entry point? Flat line, increase, and it's going to decrease in Exponentially, constant, straight line, totally depends on the reaction rate. Okay, so we'll look at various examples, but for a first order system we'd expect something like that. So this amount then leaving at the exit, that's F A at V equal to V. So FA is the molar flow of A at the entrance, or in this case here at the exit. It's totally a function of where I am along the position of the tube. Okay, so this integral tells me then what FA is going to be. If I integrate this integral between FA0 and at the exit FA, I integrate, I substitute in my rate, RA, now notice here this is key. This is not minus RA, this is plus RA. So what I will do in the future is I'll emphasize that by writing plus RA. It's not the usual minus RA. This is the rate of generation of A, not the rate of consumption of A. And that's equal to the integral from zero. So at the ends of my reactor, V is equal to zero. Let's write that and emphasize that V is equal to zero. At the exit, V is equal to V, integrate that, I get the total volume of the plug flow reactor. So I can use this equation now and integrate it to find what FA is going to be at the exit for a given volume. Or conversely, if I know my volume, I can sub in and find what FA is going to be at the exit. So those are the two ways we generally use this equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write up a problem here on the board for you to take a look at. And we'll pick it up next class. You should solve it um, outside of class. It really is just a straightforward application of, of this system. So here's, here, here it is. It's very similar to what we had last time. But there's some, there's some important assumptions you need to make and think through in this. So don't start from that equation I ended up in the all, but start from the general mole balance re-derive it for yourself, and make sure you understand every assumption that's made along the way. So for a liquid system, A going to B, and for a first order reaction, the rate of consumption of A is equal to KCA with K is equal to 0.23 minus 2 minus 1. It's the same kinetics as the batch example we had in the last class. That's intentional as far as to compare these systems later on. Q0 is equal to 10 liters per minute. What is Q? So Q0 is the entry volumetric flow rate. What is the volumetric flow rate leaving the tube? Same in steady state. Okay. So let's just note here at steady state. This is especially true for a liquid system. That's why I've emphasized that it's a liquid system. What's coming in is going to leave at the exit there at steady state. This implies that Q is equal to Q0. What is the volume required 
to achieve 90% conversion. So how long or how big in meters cubed do I need that tube to be to get a 90% conversion, i.e. CA leaving is equal to 0.1 CA entering. Okay, so notice here I'm giving you this information in CA, but the derivation we made on the on this on the board here was in terms of air frame, so you need to make a substitution there. Here's another interesting question I want you to take a look at. So, so that's the first part. The second part is same idea, how big, but for instead of 10% conversion, for 99% conversion. So your boss wants you to, not he's not happy with 90%, he or she wants 99%. How much bigger does that reactor need to be? 50% bigger, 20% bigger, 100% bigger. Then one other question I want you to think about, and then I'll end off here, is what would happen to the conversion if we halved the volumetric flow rate coming in? So Q goes to half the value. So if your company isn't doing so well anymore, there's no, no demand for the product, you need to halve the volumetric flow rate through your system, what's going to happen to the conversion? Intuitively, what's going to happen without doing any calculations? Decrease, stay the same. Decrease, go up. Okay, so you do, go through the calculations and see what happens if Q is fine.